Saint John the Apostle, also called Saint John the Evangelist, Saint John the Great, and Saint John the Beloved, was one of the twelve apostles of Jesus Christ. He is the son of Zebedee, a Galilean fisherman, and Salome, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. He is also the younger brother of James, who was also among the twelve apostles. James and John were Jesus' cousins. John and his brother James were among the first disciples called by Jesus Christ. His mother was among those women who ministered to the circle of disciples. John and James were called sons of thunder by Jesus Christ. Perhaps because of some character traits such as the zeal exemplified in them. He was one of Jesus' closest confidants. Interestingly, the Apostle John is mentioned by name in every gospel except the one named after him. John was a fisherman just like his father. John lived in Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. And John later moved to Ephesus. Apostle John, or John the Apostle, was born around 6 CE, that is common era, in Bethsaida, Galilee, in the Roman Empire, to Zebedee, a fisherman, and Salome, who is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, according to some traditions. He and his brother James fished in the Sea of Galilee uh, with their father Zebedee. And also, from the record, John and his brother were referred to as Bonages or Sons of Thunder by Jesus and uh, presumably because of their zealousness and intolerance these qualities are evident in the gospel story in which they wanted to call down heavenly fire on an inhospitable Samaritan town for which they were rebuked by Jesus also John is one of the most interesting and intense characters in the Bible. Besides uh, Apostle John, he is also called John the Beloved, John the Evangelist, and John the Elder. He is a person who was closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry. John alone with Peter, and James formed Jesus' inner cycle. He was also one of the original 12 apostles. So this is much I can say about John. The Apostle John, also known as St. John, and uh, was one of the disciples Jesus first called. He was one of the closest confidants of Jesus Christ. It's one person that was tagged the beloved. So if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his name came up there more. And uh, James' his brother, they were all partners, partners, both as fishermen and uh, even as disciples of Jesus. He was first a disciple of John the Baptist. Apostle John is traditionally believed to be one of the two disciples who witnessed the descending of the dove upon Jesus Christ, calling him the Lamb of God during his baptism. And he followed Jesus Christ and spent the day with him. Zebedee the fisherman and his sons fished in the Sea of Galilee where Jesus then came to call Peter 
Andrew, James, and John, and they followed him. Even though there is not so much clear account about conversion evidence, but what we know about this man, John, is the fact that he was uh, one of the two disciples of John the Baptist who followed Jesus and spent days with him after hearing uh, John the Baptist calling Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God, along with Peter, Andrew, and his brother James. He followed Jesus after they were called. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 35 to 39, it tells us a little bit about his life. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus, he walked. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, Say to them, what do you seek? They say to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. So, John the Apostle was, first of all, a disciple of John the Baptist, which that tells us that that was where his conversion took place. And of course, we know about the preaching of uh, John the Baptist, about repentance and what a few. I sincerely believe that this was where the conversion took place before his call. And when John was called, he was about one of the youngest of all the apostles. And since his call, he did not go back. So uh, his brothers, himself and his brothers, were disciples of John. Jesus then called Peter, called Andrew, and these two sons of Zebedee, James and John and they are among the 12 so this is what actually I could say about his background before he became the disciple of Jesus it is recorded clearly in the Bible that John was among Jesus Christ's closest disciples he was present at the resurrection of Jairus' daughter, also at Jesus' transfiguration and at the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus was arrested. John was also described as a pillar of the Jerusalem church by Apostle Paul. Apostle John was also the one that reported to Jesus Christ that they had forbidden a non-disciple from casting out demons in Jesus' name. There are a particular three times in the scripture, himself, John, and his brothers, James and Peter, they were with Jesus in a very three particular situation. One of them was when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. If you remember very well, Jesus told everybody to stay outside and he entered with some of his disciples. So Jesus entered into Jairus' house with three of them, James, John, and Peter. That's number one. Secondly, they were with Jesus on the mountain top, on the mountain of transfiguration. James, John, and Peter were with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. You know, they were so surprised. There was a sample that Jesus carried with him. John and his brother were the, were the one. And also on the night of betrayal, on the night of betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, where Jesus took Peter, James, and himself, they pray. You know, the Bible told us that the sword that was coming out of Jesus was like blood. At that point in time, the three people that were with Jesus were John, 
James and Peter. The call of John, uh, we can refer back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 35, following. Because that was where they followed Jesus, after Jesus was introduced as the Lamb of God. And they followed him to when they were called. Now, there is no information in the Bible concerning the duration of John's activities, particularly in Judea. But according to tradition, John and the other disciples remained some 12 years in the field of labor. And the persecution of the Christians under Herod Agrippa I led to the scattering of the apostles through the Roman uh, Empire provinces. And if you look at Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 17, it tells us more about all that happened. But then, throughout the period of three and a half years, they were with Jesus as disciples. They were being tutored, being discipled by Jesus. And you will also recall, and particularly on the on the uh, the event of um, transfiguration, the event of the transfiguration, John, the apostle, Peter and James were together. I mean, and Peter were called together to go for that prayer before the transfiguration experience took place. So, and then if you continue to look at the life of this man, John, he was so close to Jesus. And that is why in his later, I mean, in his gospel, he is called John the Beloved. He referred to himself John the Beloved. And if I also want to refer us to what happened at the cross, most of the disciples actually deserted. Only John the Apostle was there. And um, Jesus, before his crucifixion, handed over Mary, his mother, to John. And you remember that during the words of G uh, Jesus on the cross, one of them that we usually read is, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And the tradition says, after that encounter, John the Apostle took care of Mary unto uh, her old age. So, there are so many, so many more things that has happened about this man, which is very, very interesting. He's an interesting character. You could just imagine being called at that young age, and he continued until he died, almost at the age of 100, he never wavered on his faith. John, due to his closeness to Jesus Christ and the trust Christ had for him, was sent along with Peter into the city to make preparation for the final Passover meal. He was a disciple who obviously developed spiritual grace during Christ's ministry. John alone among the apostles remained near Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross on Calvary. Apostle John together with Peter took a prominent part in the founding and guidance of the church. He was with Apostle Peter at the healing of the lame man at the Solomon's porch in the temple and he was also thrown into prison with Peter. He also went with Peter to visit the newly converted believers in Samaria. Apostle John and his brother James, together with St. Peter, formed an inner nucleus of intimate disciples. This was why he was referred to Apostle John the Beloved, because of the love Jesus had for him. 
Apostle John traveled far and wide to preach the gospel and also spread the gospel to the world during his lifetime. Um, talking about missionary journey, you know, his own life is not the same thing like that of Apostle Paul, where you will hear of first missionary journey, second missionary journey, and all of that. We don't have any account about missionary journeys of John the Apostle. But so much of his life was all about the teachings he received and the impact he, he, he lived to make. And if you go through his gospel, you will see how he presented Jesus differently. From chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3, you will see how he presented the divinity of Jesus in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And it moves on to the, um, the marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and it moved on to Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus. So these are some of the things you will see about John the Apostle. And if you read through his record, you won't see specifically something mentioned about missionary journey but we know that persecution actually took him to some places which i'm sure in the course of this um, um interview we will see more of that apostle john was one of the most important disciples of jesus christ and he was among the three that followed christ everywhere he went and can be referred to as his personal assistant. Due to his faith in Christ Jesus, he was able to receive revelations from God. He was passionately devoted to the proclamation of truth in Christ Jesus. Keeping faith in relating to Christ Apostle John, John was part of the inner circle of Jesus, you know, the larger circle of the twelve and the inner circle. So along with his brothers, just like we said earlier, and he had opportunity. Maybe one thing that grew the faith of Apostle John was because he had opportunity to encounter some inner events of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe if he hadn't had that opportunity to encounter those inner events, like in seeing Jesus prayed and sweating, like being together with the Lord Jesus on, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, maybe him seeing Jesus heal Jairus and several close situations, Maybe the situation wouldn't, maybe he wouldn't have, have so, had so much faith that he had. But these are some of the events that you could see in his life that possibly has affected or affected his faith. He saw situations barely with his hand, with his eye, with his face, eyes. He saw them clearly and they were so glaring to him. So even me, I could put myself in a situation like being in that opportunity, being in that, that state at that point in time. Seeing the Lord Jesus being transfigured in my face, it's enough for me to change everything in me. Because out of every out of 12 men, I had the opportunity to be with the Lord Jesus. And unfortunately for the others, they never had that opportunity. But I had that opportunity to be with the Lord Jesus being transfigured. And it's being seen in a different platform entirely. Not just being seen in a different part of the platform entirely, but I saw Elijah and I saw Moses coming down with him. Elijah was with him. Moses was with him. It was the prophet, old prophet, patriarchs of old that lived before Jesus came down. And I saw it. It's enough to affect everything, everything about me. The totality of my being entirely. Physically, spiritually, in every entity. So I want to believe that that's one thing that affected his faith. And that was one of the reasons, I guess, that made him to go ahead more. And when we want to relate this to Christians these days, maybe we need evidences like this to, to affect our faith. Maybe we need evidence. This is like, you know, Jesus showing, showing us sign. Sign that he exists. Sign that he's God. Sign that he's the king of the world. Sign that he's the son of God. Try signs that will show him that he rules and reigns over all. 
maybe that will affect our faith too because Christianity these days it seems to be like a desica. We don't seem to worship the Lord so much again. Sin has infiltrated into our society, into the church, you know. We just do things the way we feel like we should do it. Not many of the time I tend to sit down and think like, is it the same faith that John, Peter, Paul believe that we are practicing these days? I can't I find it difficult to see a correlation. I find it difficult to see a correlation because they suffered for this gospel. John, James, Peter, the disciples, the Paul, all of them suffered for this gospel. Maybe because they had first hand information from the Lord Jesus. Maybe we too need that kind of force. Maybe the Lord needs to show himself to us too. Maybe when he shows himself to us, we can have that, that, that convincing faith. That faith that is grounded, that unshakable faith in him. And unfortunately, that's not been seen in our days today, but we believe that the Lord will affect our world and society very clearly. So it was passionate, passionately devo devoted to proclaiming the truth, and it kept on going and it never stopped. It kept on going and it never stopped. So these days, we we'll pray that the Lord will convince us. We we'll pray that the Lord will help us. We we'll pray that the Lord will give us grace to believe Him more. But sincerely, the level of our faith is beginning to go down day by day. We finally beginning to see things not the way the Lord will have seen it, not the way God will have seen it, but we need Him to convince us, to give us a sign that He is God. I'm just saying anyway, maybe just like Apostle John saw it, that helped his faith, maybe that will help our own faith too in these days now. And I hope that God will convince the Christians of this world for a greater thing to happen in Jesus' name. It is recorded that Apostle John was persecuted during his days, but God was with him all through, and he survived all the persecutions. Of course, like any other apostle, uh, John did not escape persecution. Of course, he was also persecuted. Now, by the order of the Roman emperor called Demetria, John was exiled to the island called Patmos. Demetria ordered his exile because he saw John as a threat to his rule. However, his popularity and influence in the Christian community continued through correspondence with all the churches that is churches founded he was sending letters to them talking to them about their faith which if you read the three of his epistles uh, first John second John third John you see all of those were epistles he was sending to church in Ephesus that he established now according to the christian writer called tertullian for preaching the gospel roman authorities exiled him to island of patmos after throwing him into boiling oil from which he escaped unharmed you could just imagine that Boiling oil was boiled, and then John was thrown into that oil. But miraculously, he escaped without any harm. And when he was exiled to the land of Patmos, to the island of Patmos, he received the revelation from Christ. In that island called Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. So, indeed, Apostle John was persecuted. But among all the apostles, Apostle John is one apostle that did not die because of martyrdom. There was an effort to kill him, but he didn't die. And then he at the end of the day, after all the after the writing of the book of Revelation, of course, after some time we're going to look at his death, but he died a natural death.
Apostle John was an example of a good leader, and that can be seen in the book of Acts. He was a servant leader who don't just give command, but work as well. His humility as a leader was one of the reasons Jesus Christ drew him closer to himself. Definitely there are some leadership qualities we have to draw from the life of us. Number one is zeal for the truth. Zeal for the truth. Like, our world is so much so the way it is now that people telling the truth are not so common again. People, the truth has been sold out. Nobody is telling the truth any longer. Even in church, people telling the truth are so scarce now. Everybody is lying over one thing or the other. That's number one. Thing we need to learn from the life of Apostle John. Number two is confidence and boldness. It's confidence and boldness. There were these days you find people with confidence and boldness that is equal to pride. I want to say that again. These days in our world, you see people with so much confidence, with so much boldness. But when you make an addition in mathematics that confidence plus boldness, these days it's equal to pride. But in the time of John the Apostle, his confidence and boldness was his court with humility. That's one quality that we don't seem to find much these days. Confidence is a very wonderful virtue that all of us need. But without humility, it's nothing. My Apostle John added it in excess. He was confident, he was bold, and yet he was humble. Now, talking about his leadership quality, uh, the Gospel of John is one of uh, those Gospels that you would need to read if you want to be a good leader. If you don't read the Gospel of John and his epistles, then so many things will be missing. What do I mean? If you read John chapter 10, verse 1 to 18. It tells us about the records of Christ's monologue about being a good shepherd. And in this monologue, Jesus likened himself to a gate through which his sheep enter into pasture and a good shepherd who lays his life down for those sheep. And I want to believe that Apostle John was not just uh, writing those things for record purposes. These teachings of Jesus about being a good shepherd must have influenced his life. So, if you want to, in our modern day Christianity and society, if you want to be a good leader, one place you should look to is the writings of John and what he has for us as a record. And that is why we will see there Jesus say, I am the good shepherd. You can't be a good leader if you are not a shepherd. We must look at characteristic of a shepherd. A shepherd who is not a hireling will always be willing to give his life to protect his sheep. If we can relate it with our contemporary shepherds today, I'm not talking about his men who goes about perpetrating evil. I'm talking about real typical shepherd. They care for their sheep. They know their sheep by, their, by, by name. Their sheep know them. And they do everything possible to ensure that their sheep are protected. So for you to be a good leader, you ought to be a shepherd. That is, putting your life, the life of your sheep, above your own life. Ensuring that people under you are properly protected and taken care of before yourself. So that is one thing we will see about the man Apostle John. But also, if you, if we can also go to John chapter 
13. In the gospel record, John chapter 13, we're talking about the washing of the feet. That record is only found in the gospel according to St. John. These other synoptic gospels don't have that record. Now, I want to read chapter 13, verse 1, following. And then, so that we will see certain things. Or perhaps, let me just read from verse 12. So, when he had washed their feet, taking his garment and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, there is one significant lesson also in this passage that we have read. The... the the leadership quality of Apostle John also here is talking about servant leadership. Of all the four Gospels, only John wrote about the washing of the feet in John 13, 1 to 15, where I've just read. And you will see what Jesus Christ demonstrated in this passage. Son of God. The master. He was their master. He was Lord. But he demonstrated the act of humility. He stood low by washing his disciples' feet. And he told them that, look, I've set an example for you. Go and do likewise. Now, if you want to be a leader, then you must serve. That is the message Apostle John is passing across here. If you want to be a leader, then you must serve. Leadership is about service. And of course, the part of greatness is the part of service. If you want to be great, Jesus Christ told us that. He who wants to be great... He must be what? He must be the servant of all. He must serve. And that is what we can see uh, being demonstrated here. Our world clamors to get ahead and fights for control. We want to boss people around. You want to sit on your table, other people here and there, go and do this, go and do that, and all of that. But you see, from what we are learning here, Leadership is about leading by example. You ought to do it by yourself, by serving. So, Jesus looked to the Father and did not grasp equality with him, but humbled himself to death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 to 11 tells us that about Jesus. But you see, talking about John, for John to have concentrated in reporting washing of the feet, it tells you that John is one man that believes in servant leadership. From the life of Apostle John, it is seen that he was humble, dedicated to his duty, and carried out any instruction given to him by Christ. He was a perfect example of servant leadership, a good shepherd, and he stood for the faith 
till the end. Um, there is so much we can learn from Apostle John. From record, he was one of the youngest disciple of Jesus. I mean the 12th disciple of Jesus. He was one of the youngest. And throughout his life, from when he was, from being the disciple of John the Baptist to when he was called, he was very, very zealous. He did his work until he died was still in the faith which tells you that he kept this faith and he even related to others because despite the persecution if if you were the one that uh, was thrown inside the boiling oil by the time you escape from it i don't know what would be your mind on that uh, kind of situation but you see this man continued he was unwavering he was persistent he continued and even when he was banished to the island of patmos and you know usually when you are banished you're not going to carry so many things with you things that will give you comfort you are banished you have been exiled go away from here we don't want to see you here anymore and he went there and it was on that banishment that this apostle was still able to write revelation chapter 1 to 22. if you look at revelation each time you read it you will see indeed that this was an apocalyptic writing it was a revelation from God. So, and it was towards the end of his life that he wrote the book of Revelation, which means that Apostle John continued in faith. He didn't run away. There was no challenge that was too big that would make him not to continue. Despite the persecution, he continued. So, young men in the ministry, you have to continue to move on. No matter what, because we have an example. Apostle John has given us an example for what it means. From young age to almost 100, he was still in the faith. And of course, as a result of his writing, we still have books written by him that we're reading today. Apostle John has been an important figure for Christianity because he is believed to have been the author of the fourth non-synoptic gospel, three canonical letters, and the book of Revelation, which the church tradition also agreed upon. Apostle John is the author of five New Testament books. Number one, the Gospel according to St. John. Number two, there are three short epistles that will also bear his name, 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. And of course, we have the book of Revelation. Now, talking about the gospel according to St. John, just as a coin has two sides, both valid. So, Jesus Christ has two nature, both valid. Uh, Luke presented Christ in his humanity as the Son of Man, but John portrayed him in his deity as the son of god john proposes is crystal clear to set forth christ in his deity in order to spark belief in faith in his reader and john's gospel is topical as well as chronological it revolves around seven miracles 
and seven I am statement of Christ. That is what you will see about uh, gospel according to uh, St. John. I'm following an extended eyes witness description of the upper room, uh, upper room meal and discord. John records event leading to the resurrection, the final climatic proof that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God. And uh, talking about the summary of the first epistle of John, what you will see in his first epistle is that God is light. God is love. God is life. So John is, John is enjoying a delightful fellowship with that, with that of uh, God as light, love, and life. So if you see how John organized it, it is just very, very beautiful. Talking about God is light, therefore is to engage in fellowship with him. We must walk in light and not in darkness. As we walk in light, we will regularly confess our sins, allowing the blood of Christ to continually cleanse us. Talking about God is love. Since we are his children, we must walk in love. And talking about God is light, those who fellowship with him must possess his quality of life. Spiritual life begins with spiritual birth, with a call through faith in Jesus Christ. So that is what you will see in the first epistle. Then the second epistle concentrated more on let him who thinks he stands take he lays he fall although that is a word from corinthians but that is all that john was trying to let us know here this was of paul could well stand as a substitute for john's uh, little epistle the recipient a chosen lady and her children were obviously standing. They were walking in faith, remaining faithful to the commandment they have received from the Father. So John is deeply pleased to be able to commend them, but he takes nothing for granted, realizing that standing is just one step. Removing from falling, he hesitated not at all to issue a reminder to say love one another if you look at uh, verse 5 love one another so the apostle the apostle admits that this is not a new revelation but he view it as sufficiently important to repeat so talking about the need not to take uh, the issue of faith for granted and also you will see in verse 1, the elders of verse 1 has been traditionally identified with the Apostle John, resulting in the Greek. That is about the second epistle. And then you also see the third, the, the, the third epistle of Apostle is about the encouragement. Encourages, he encourages fellowship with Christian brothers following his expression of love for Gaius. And then John assured him of his prayers for his health and voices his joy over Gaius persistent to walk in faith and for the manner in which he showed hospitality and support for missionary work. So again, John was writing to Gaius, the elder. Now, the, 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 the last one is Revelation. The Revelation of Christ. So, just as Genesis is the book of beginning, Revelation is the book of consummation. In it, the divine program of redemption is brought to fruition. And the holy name of God is vindicated before all creation. 
And the title of this book in Greek is Apocalypse. That is the, the, the revelation of John. It is also known as the Apocalypse. So it's all about the revelation of Christ and what is going to happen at the end of the age. So this is about the summary. And these are the books that were written by John the Apostle. It is recorded that Apostle John died at old age and is the only apostle that didn't die through persecution like the rest who were martyred for their faith. Officially, the apostle's grave is at Ephesus. John's life serves to remind us of several lessons. And these lessons, we can apply them to our lives. Number one, zeal for the truth must always be balanced by a love for people. Without zeal, well, without it, zeal can turn to harshness and judgmentalism. Conversely, abundant love that lacks the ability to discern truth from error can become gushing sentimentality. As John learned as he matured, if we speak the truth in love, we and those we touch will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So, John was someone with a lot of zeal. But one of the things we need to learn is that if you have zeal for, for God, you must also have love for Him. Zeal and love must go together. Secondly, um, confidence and boldness. John was someone that was very, very confident, very, very bold untempered by compassion and grace. Confidence is a wonderful virtue which every Christian should have. But without humility, it becomes a self-confidence. If you have confidence without humility, it becomes a self-confidence which can lead to boasting and it will become an attitude of exclusiveness. When that happens, a witness of the grace of God is taunted. Others see in us exactly the kind of person we wish not to be. So from, from this man, you could see someone who persisted, who was unwavering, who continued from when he was called to the end of his life. Even at the foot of the at the at the foot of the cross, when other disciples were no more, John was there. It was because he was there that was why Jesus Christ was able to hand over his mother to him. And indeed, it tells you that the name John the Beloved actually worked out in his life. It is as a result of love that he went all through. John was an apostle that loved God. And he continued, and uh, despite all that uh, that happened, so there is so much we can learn from John, the apostle, and lessons we can take home. And so let us let us be encouraged. Let us learn from this man. Uh, it should be your encouragement as a Christian. John was able to hold on. We must also continue to hold on, no matter what will come our way. I just want to pray for us that whatever challenge you're facing right now, you can't give up. Apostle John never gave up. He held on. And because he held on, God granted him more strength. God will grant him more strength in your situation. And uh, he faced so many difficulties, and God granted him the grace. The Lord will grant you grace. John affected the society positively. The grace to affect your society positively, the Lord will grant unto you. 
John died at old age. He will not die before your time. In the mighty name of Jesus. John lived a successful life. You will fulfill your purpose in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. John was an instrument, a vessel of honor unto the name of the Lord. The Lord will cause you to and make you a vessel of honor unto his name. In the mighty name of Jesus. John blessed society. It was a blessing to the society at that one time. The Lord will make you a blessing to your generation. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Whatever difficulty John faced at that point in time, the Lord took care of it. I pray for you. Whatever difficulty you're facing, the Lord will take care of it for you. In the name of Jesus. John shine. You will shine. You will reign and you will shine. Your star will not go down. In the name of Jesus. When it comes to matter of the things of the Lord, the Lord will direct your feet unto where you will minister. It will fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like you feel John with the power of the Holy Spirit. It will fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit and it will put upon you the every spirit of enablement to do greater things and next door for his name. In the name of Jesus. You will never go dry, tired. You will never go dry. Freshness upon you continuously. Freshness upon you continually. Grace for you. Increase for you. Prosperity for you. Enlargement on your way and all that concerns you. In the name of Jesus, the Lord will guide your step unto greatness and unto greater things. And it shall be well with you. God bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.